Now that we have a better idea of the code that's running inside of our contract, we're going to use the Remix tool to test our contract. We'll first start off by taking a look at a diagram that'll give you a better sense of what Remix is going to do for us. So at this point, we're sitting down inside of the Remix editor, and we have some amount of contract source. We're about to have this contract be automatically compiled by the Solidity compiler, and that's going to compile it to bytecode. That will then be deployed to an in-browser fake Ethereum network, and that will give us an instance of our inbox contract. Now this part right here might sound a little bit surprising, in-browser fake network. Well, behind the scenes, Remix is not just a code editor. It also hosts a miniature, tiny little fake Ethereum network that we can use to simulate deploying and interacting with our contract. Like I said, this tool is really fantastic. Remix is really tops in that regard. So we're going to attempt to deploy our contract source to this fake network that's running inside of our browser right now. All right, so let's give this a shot. I'm gonna collapse the left-hand nav over here just to give myself a little bit of space. And I'm going to zoom out just a little bit so I can show you more stuff on my screen. It's kind of a hard balance right now to make sure you can see everything but also still have it kind of large. So hopefully this is gonna be somewhat reasonable right here. All right, so I now have three tabs open or three panes open, I should say. On the top left, we've got our code. On the bottom left is a console that describes things that are happening on the in-browser network. You'll notice that nothing is really being printed out here right now because we haven't interacted with this fake network at all. I'm gonna find the top right-hand tab marked as run. So here's run right here. And unfortunately, I think I need to zoom out just a little bit more. Hopefully that's still legible. Okay, so on, on here, you can see a couple of different settings, and we'll walk through all these over time. The first thing I wanna point out to you, and this is extremely important, find the environment setting right here. Chances are it might say something like Injected Web 3 right now. We do not want to use Injected Web 3. Instead, we want to use JavaScript VM. By selecting JavaScript VM right there, that tells the Remix tool that we want to attempt to deploy our contract to the in-browser virtual Ethereum network. Next, you'll see a listing that says account. When you select the JavaScript VM right here, that boots up the internal virtual network, and then it automatically creates a handful of different accounts, each of which are assigned 100 Ether to work with. So these are all accounts that exist only inside of our browser right now, and they have been pre-funded with 100 Ether. So as you can see, this makes life really easy for testing our contract out. Underneath that, you'll see something that says gas limit. Now we haven't really discussed gas just yet. This is something that we're going to come back to very shortly and talk about in a little bit. Let's just leave it there for right now. Finally, you'll see something that says value. Value is used to make a transaction and also send al along some amount of ether with the transaction. We'll use this value setting later on as we start to test some of our other contracts. Now down here is where things start to get really interesting. You'll see a dropdown and it has selected already inbox. This is selecting a contract that we want to attempt to deploy to our local test network that's running inside the browser. Underneath that, you'll see something that says string initial message. And then to the right, it says create. So this is a lot of fun. I enjoy this a lot. Okay, so here's what's happening. Remember I had said that we have a function over here that has the same exact name as our contract. And because it had the same name, this is what we refer to as a constructor function. And constructor functions are automatically called whenever we first deploy or create an instance of a contract. Our constructor function says that it accepts a string argument that is called initial message. So notice how string initial message also appears over here in this input. So what we're going to do is enter in some string, then click create. When we do that, a instance of our inbox contract will be automatically created. The constructor function will be called, and this constructor function will be called with an initial message of whatever we place into this input right here. So let's do that right now. I'm gonna type inside of here, inside of a string, hi there. Make sure you get double quotes around this. 
and then I'll click Create. All right, we see a little bit of activity over here in the console. And then for you, you can probably see it much more easily than I, down here at the bottom, there's now a new entry. This represents a contract that we just deployed to our local test fake network. So this is an instance of the inbox contract. This instance right here lists out all the different functions contained with the, on it on the, on the contract instance itself, which are essentially all the different ways that we can interact with the contract. These are buttons, and if we click any of them, it will automatically invoke the corresponding function inside of our contract. The buttons that are kind of this bluish violet look right here mean that they are view or constant functions that can be called and instantly re will return some amount of data to us. On the other hand, we have the set message function, which is a function that is going to modify the contents of our, of our contract in some fashion. Just like the input for the constructor function up here, notice that set message also tells us exactly what type of input is expected when we call it. So set message expects to be called with a string that's called new message internally. So if we want to call that function, we would have to put something inside of here that specifies exactly what we're trying to update that value to be. Let's try clicking on get message right now and just see what happens. So I'll click it and you can see the return of that function call right here. It says that we got back zero. Zero means that this is the first returned value from the function. In this case, our function only returns one value. And so this is the first of just the one value that gets returned. If we had returned multiple values from get message, then we would see zero, a value, and then one, and the next value that got returned. After the zero, we get the type of data that got returned. So in this case, our message is always a string. And so this is telling us we got back a value of type string. And then finally, it tells us the actual value that was returned, which in this case is high there. Let's try using the set message button down here as well. So we can enter in a new message as a string. For this one, let's do something like buy there. I'm not very original, I guess. Make sure you wrap this in quotes as well and then we'll click set message. So that's going to send a function call to our deployed contract. You can see that inside of our console over here, and that invokes the set message function within our inbox contract. Notice how when we called set message, that updated the value of the internal message variable right here, or at least we hope it did, but it did not automatically update the value of hi there that we had just gotten back from calling get message. So these values will not automatically update. Instead, we have to click get message again to attempt to retrieve that value again. And now it gets updated to buy there. At this point in time, we haven't really, I haven't really taken the time to tell you what this contract does, but at this point, I think you probably get a pretty reasonable idea of what it's doing for us. So here's a diagram of our contract as it is deployed currently on the test network. Inside the contract storage, we have that message variable, and it can be modified or accessed by either the get message or set message functions, and either of those can be called by anyone on the network. So essentially, our contract right now is just storing a little message that someone else can read. Now there's one last thing that I wanna point out, and this is the first gotcha, the first gotcha that we're gonna talk about with Solidity. I want to take a look at these two functions right here. Notice how we have set message and get message. So I think their purposes are pretty clear. One's going to fetch the value of message, the other one is going to update it. If you look down here at the bottom right, however, you'll notice that we have a third button that is marked simply as message. Well, let's try clicking that and see what happens. Notice how it returns the exact same value as the get message function. So here's the first gotcha. And this one maybe isn't quite so much a gotcha. Maybe it's just kind of an interesting fact of how Solidity works. Whenever you define a storage variable, and remember we define those right here, if you mark that variable with the public keyword, then your contract is going to automatically create a new function for you. That function will have the exact same name as your variable. If you call that function, it will return the variable itself. In other words, the get message function that we created right here 
is a little bit superfluous. In other words, it's a really a duplicate of some existing functionality that we already got for free. So because we use the public keyword right here on message, that automatically created a new function for us behind the scenes that allows us to access the value of message. I specifically wanted to do this kind of like little oopsie kind of gotcha thing right here because this is something that I see a lot of people run into very frequently. They might write a get function that attempts to retrieve a value when it turns out one already gets created for free for you. So if we wanted to, we might decide to just delete this function right here and get rid of it altogether because we can just make use of the pre-generated message function that's going to return that value anyways. I think maybe we should do actually do that and delete this function here and then redeploy our contract and see how that works. Let's take a break and then take care of that in the next video.